Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Nice to see you all tonight. Thanks for coming on out. We haven't been to Birmingham in a while, about a year now. For those that don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman, and I too have MS, and I'm sure that you all know this already, but I have to say, hey, y'all, right? This is where I am. Tonight's program, we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to have Dr. Emily Reiser here. Oh, she's here already. And we're going to have some new conversations going on here. And tonight, we want to thank Santa Fe Genzyme for providing us with the grant that we got from them so that we could hold tonight's program. And I hope that you could all thank them as well. Say thank you, everybody. All right, about Dr. Reiser. Dr. Reiser, you know, she's an MD, and she got her degree from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. She is the medical director of Tanner Center for Multiple Sclerosis for 15 years now. She is also affiliated with and clinical associate professor, Department of Neurology at UAB. She's a clinical associate professor, School of Allied Health, Department of Physical Therapy at UAB. Member of UAB Lakeshore Collaborative Team, member of the National MS Society Health Advisory Committee, past member of the National MS Society Board of Trustees. She's done a lot. It sounds like she's done a great job, right, for the MS community. So I want to thank her as well. She's board certified in neurology, neurorehabilitation, and neuro neuroimaging. Let's thank and welcome Dr. Emily Reiser. Holding it. I'll hold it. I'll start now. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you so much, Stuart. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And um, MS News and Views is an amazing organization. And like Stuart said, if you haven't had the opportunity to check out their website in these videos, you really need to do this because it is an amazing resource. Um, some of the best speakers in the country are part of these videos. So I really would encourage everyone to, to reach out and to take a look at, that, at the content of the program. So tonight, I'm here with Tracy Fleming Tracy. <laughs> Tracy Tracy uh, and uh, Tracy and I have had uh, a wonderful opportunity to work together for goodness gracious over 10 years over a decade uh, and she's an occupational therapist and someone who's so passionate about helping patients with MS and she has really just been such a great resource to me I've learned so much from being with her and I think you're gonna enjoy her presentation tonight so Stuart has asked me to talk briefly about multiple sclerosis but to talk about a few barriers that we're beginning to encounter on our journey as we try to see a world free of MS and try to help our patients to get the best outcomes that, that they can get. So that being said, I'm looking around the room. Many of you are veterans. Uh, I see many of you that have MS. I see many of you who are caregivers. Thank you for your extraordinary work and what you do to help your loved ones. And uh, I appreciate really your, your being here tonight because it is not easy coming out here on 280 uh, in five o'clock traffic. <laughs> it took me an hour to get here from Homewood, so thank you very much. Um, so does it go like that? Oh. So we're going to talk briefly about MS, and I think most of you know this, is that MS is an autoimmune disease, and it doesn't hurt to refresh ourselves as to what that is, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. But basically, at the end of the day, you know, the immune system uh, begins to target the central nervous system, and we forget that in the central nervous system, not only do we have the brain, but we have the spinal cord and the optic pathways. So when you think about this autoimmune disease affecting this part of our body, the clinical manifestation of that can almost be anything. And it has occurred to me that I've been seeing patients that have been out there for years who were not diagnosed because someone really just didn't recognize that this can be anything. Um, and this immune system works in a couple of ways. Basically, we're born with an immune system to some degree. It matures when we go through puberty. And then it kind of ages as we get to be about 45, and it changes even after that. So the landscape of the immune system is very fascinating. But at the, at the core of this, you have these things called T cells that make these products called cytokines that can be really good or really bad. And then you have B cells, which make antibodies. And I think everyone is familiar with antibodies. We have to have antibodies so that we can have a response to a vaccine. So that's part of the immune system as well. And what happens in this disease is that 
when it kind of begins to gin up, and sometimes there's not always an attack at the beginning, there can just be something kind of going on. And for many of you that have MS, you probably remember looking back that there was some kind of something. You couldn't quite describe it. But at that time, that is probably the beginning down underneath the surface of this demyelination and this secondary axonal degeneration. And I put there that this occurs early, really early. So the degeneration occurs just as early as the demyelination. So this is a depiction of the central nervous system. You can see here, here's the, I like her bun, here's the brain, spinal cord, optic pathways, and basically what's happening um, with this immune response is that this wire called the axon, which has this very healthy insulation called myelin, becomes broken down, resulting in scarring. And if there's multiple scars, then therefore the name multiple sclerosis has ensued because multiple sclerosis just denotes multiple scarring in the central nervous system. So what are the clinical manifestations of multiple sclerosis? Well, the, the primary manifestation is this thing called a relapse. And I think patients sometimes get confused about what that is. And it basically is some type of event that translates into some type of functional impairment. So it's like you get up, you're trying to go to work, you're trying to get your kids to school, you're trying to figure out what's going on, and suddenly you can't see, or you can't feel, or you can't move. It's something usually that's dramatic. It lasts for more than 24 hours, and it kind of hangs for weeks. So that's a relapse. Or the other word would be exacerbation or attack. So all of these things can be used uh, to describe a clinical relapse. The second thing that, that we, um, the manifestations of MS that occur are changes on this unique metric that we now have that's extraordinary that came online in the 80s, MRI. And we'll talk a little bit about that. That's changes in something called T2, T1, and T1 with contrast. That's what the little C stands for. But the big one, the big thing, the big unspoken, you know, elephant in the room is progression of disability. And I think that that's what scares everyone the most when they hear that they have the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. When we think about disability, this is the way that we score disability. So if you're in a clinic in an MS center and you kind of overhear someone saying EDSS, what they're talking about is the expanded disability status scale. So this is the most common metric, and Tracy might allude to this as well, that we use not only in clinical trials, but in the clinic to try to get a read on how people are doing functionally. For example, this is an ordinal scale from zero to nine. It actually goes to 10, which is six feet under, but you know, MS is not something that causes us to go six feet under. It typically, it kind of runs along this, this time course, or it used to historically before disease modifying therapies. So an EDSS of one would be someone with very minimal disability, usually some fatigue or something like that. EDSS of four is when someone begins having issues with balance and they're having trouble walking, wide base of gait, up to EDSS of 6.0, which is a single point cane. So if anyone is ambulating with a single point cane, they are an EDSS of 6.0. And then 6.5 would be bilateral assistance with a rolling walker. Seven would be probably confined to a wheelchair, although could transfer, and so on and so forth. So I just want you to be aware of the nomenclature of kind of how we measure disability as we go forward in the discussion. So what causes MS? Uh, I ask y'all all the time, what do you, what do you think? What do y'all know? Uh, I wish I knew, because um, then we could certainly, you know, 
um, find a, a cure for this, but I think that this is multifaceted. I think at the, at the foundation of this, obviously there's a genetic or what we call a genomic component. We know that parents can pass MS on to children. Um, we know that, you know, if you have MS about 20% of the time, you'll have a first cousin that has something like this. Although with identical twin sets, the prevalence rate or the uh, concordance rate is only 35%. So even though there's this genetic component to multiple sclerosis, it's not as though everyone in the family gets it. So that begs the question, what else is at play here? And I think the vitamin D theory is actually very interesting, not only from a latitudinal effect, but I think that there's studies beginning to show us that as we replace vitamin D by 10 points, that we begin to see diminishing relapses. So I think that, that at a minimum, it's important to inquire about vitamin D, to talk to your doctors about this, because it's such a simple thing to optimize. The other is viral exposure. There's a lot of talk about Epstein-Barr viruses. That's the mononucleosis virus. That's the kissing disease that kids get during adolescence. But there's a lot of interest in reactivation of mononucleosis. Excessive salt intake. Uh, I don't, well, I do see a shaker on the table. Um, so don't shake too much tonight if you have MS. There's actually some emerging data to say that excessive salt intake may um, be a potential, or I guess, risk factor, so to speak. And then as we go on smoking and obesity, and, and to me, to someone who's been practicing for 30 years, we're beginning to see some of the same kind of things that we're seeing in vascular disease. So there may be a lot of things kind of at play that we never really thought about. So be mindful of these things. Now, there won't be a test on this, but Remember, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. It is a disease that gins up the immune system to misbehave in a very bad way. And we have to remember, this is actually in the peripheral system. This is actually in the central nervous system. Remember I told you the central nervous system was the brain, the spinal cord, and the optic pathways. Well, MS does not start in the brain or in the central nervous system. MS starts in the periphery. MS starts uh, where the immune cells hang out, and that's going to be in the gut, in the lympho lymphoid tissues, in the thymus, in the spleen. So all of these little actors, these T cells and these B cells that are being tickled in a bad way to misbehave, all of it's actually happening out in the periphery. Now what starts this, we have no clue. But once this starts, the process of whereby these bad cells begin to mi migrate, excuse me, migrate across the blood-brain barrier cannot be stopped. And once the process gets into the central nervous system, this is the nerve, this is the wire, the axon, this is the myelin. And once all this starts, it's just a cascade of inflammation, secondary degeneration, degeneration at the beginning of the process. So we don't want to forget that because we're talking about early importance for treatment. And I think that we have to understand that up underneath this, even though someone's had one attack, that this is a process that's not going to stop. So we need to be mindful of that. This is some work that has been done down at a cellular level. So this is like if you put the, micros the ultra microscope on an MS scar. What you would see is you would see that these wires that previously had myelin are breaking down, but then they're becoming transected. And if, if it's easier to understand in a cartoon format, this would be a nice healthy neuron. This would be the wire, the dendritic connection. This would be the insulation, the myelin, the myelin, and the myelin. And what happens in number two is the immune cells, the T cells, the B cells making antibodies, the T cells releasing cytokines, adhere to the myelin, latch on to a protein on the myelin, cause inflammation, and then ultimately break down the wire altogether. And this is the biggest problem as it pertains to progression of disability. So this MRI scan that I talked to you about, 
It's been a game changer. It's been a game changer not only for neurologists that specialize in MS, but it's been a game changer for neurology across the board. So this would be a normal MRI of the brain, just a cross section. So if I just took a slice here above the ears, and this would be an MRI in a patient that has multiple scars, multiple sclerosis, and that's where the name came from. So the natural history of multiple sclerosis, and I can tell you because I've been there since the very beginning. Um, I was there in 1985. I was very young at the time. We were all talking about our birthdays out here. We're all getting ready to have some big birthdays, but it was a long time ago, and um, we had no treatments for MS. And, and this is what multiple sclerosis looked like, and this is what we knew it to be, and this is what we know that it is today. Basically, it starts here with some type of preclinical something. A lot of people tell me they just felt tired, they felt listless, they just felt out of it at work, they just couldn't multitask, something was kind of going on. And then suddenly they would have an event, and that's how MS starts. Remember that first relapse or that attack we talked about? But what happens, there's just relapse, with incomplete recovery, relapse, incomplete recovery, and then progression, what we call secondary progressive MS. So this is the natural history of multiple sclerosis left untreated. But the interesting thing to be mindful of, if you look at MRI activity, it starts at the beginning too. And I, I can tell you that I see patients with multiple sclerosis sometimes that have a normal MRI at the beginning of their journey. But underneath this, we begin to see more accumulation of these T2s, these scars, those things that I just showed you on that MRI. And the other thing that we've begun to appreciate, this red line, this red line, and maybe that's the thing to really take into consideration, this red line is very linear. From the time of the first event, until the time of diagnosis, that secondary axonal degeneration, that breakdown of that wire that leads to disability becomes really a huge factor in determining what outcome might be for that individual. So this is what it used to look like, okay, before disease-modifying therapies came online. But this is the exciting part right here to me. And this is, I mean, why I do what I do. And I tell everyone, I have been there for the launch of every MS drug. So that tells you how old I am. And that's why this is still so fun to me, even though I'm getting ready to have my big 6-0 next year. But this is really, really fascinating. I love this because these drugs, these disease-modifying therapies, have become game changers in the space. I mean, no doubt about it. So when we look at disability on this axis and time on this axis, what we saw, and I just showed it to you before, on the natural history was, you know, preclinical, bad feeling, first event, and then just progression. That, that's just what this just used to look like. I mean, I, I, I can see it, I remember it so vividly. But now what we know from time point of diagnosis with early intervention is that we really have changed the landscape in terms of the progression of disability, which tells us that we're having an impact on that demyelination and that secondary axonal degeneration. And this is, this is the very exciting part to me. So, guess what? These are the existing and emerging MS therapies. Have you ever seen so many dots? I mean, this is extraordinary. Okay, so when we look at this pie on the outside, we have everything that's in phase one. When we go to the next level, it's almost like an, it's like an onion, I suppose, we're peeling the onion. Everything in the second little circle is phase two. Everything in the third is phase three. Everything in the bullseye has been approved and it's FDA approved on the market. We're writing these drugs and patients are taking these drugs. I'm looking around, many of you are on, on, on a lot of these products. And these products now are divided into several types. When you look at the original products here, these products, you know, uh, are primarily interferons. And then 
We had anti-proliferative agents, which are like kind of cancer agents, vaccine tolerization, cytolytics, you know, symptomatic treatments, lymphocytic trafficking. So the scientists have really been able to tease so much more of this out from the original launch of beta seron in 1993. So this is, this is really extraordinary, and this makes me really happy um, when I look at this. All right, so what is the rationale for early treatment? And those of you that know me, and I know all the doctors that you guys see too, and they would agree with me, that it's really important to consider getting on a treatment as early as possible, assuming everything lines up after the first event. And these are a lot of little small little things in the wheel, but basically, Immune modulating treatments affect inflammation. So if we can affect inflammation, it stands to reason that we can impact downstream secondary axonal degeneration, okay? Number two, antigen spreading. That's kind of an immune thing. Early course influences long-term outcome. We have data to show that. Um, evidence of better response to treatment in early phases of the disease. So these diseases work better early on than they do late. I have a lot of people come in that are secondary progressive MS asking me for disease modifying therapies that really aren't indicated at that point. Long-term benefits, recovery mechanisms, long longitudinal changes, positive results of studies, and so on and so forth. So this is not just something that someone is just telling you. There is scientific evidence behind this notion that early treatment, once MS is diagnosed, is really, really, really important. So what else do we know now? Well, we now know that um, we have the ability through using disease-modifying drugs to achieve this thing called NEDA, this acronym NEDA, N-E-D-A, and it stands for No Evidence of Disease Activity no evidence of disease activity. And it's gone through a few iterations, but the, base, the basic concept here for NIDA, and I think you need to know about this because when you speak with your neurologist uh, or your clinicians, you might want to inquire about, am I, is, is NIDA, is that something that's, that's you know, a possibility for me? And basically in NIDA, no perceived relapses, no T2 lesions, no GAD activity, no progression of disability. Now, the next iteration will be no brain atrophy, but we don't have a great common metric in the community to, to uh, determine about brain atrophy yet. That's more in like scientific projects. But NIDA, no evidence of disease activity, really speaks to the first couple of slides I talked to you about, which is relapses, changes on MRI, and progression of disability. And this is achievable. This would be my goal for any patient that I see and treat who has multiple sclerosis. So, how do we approach this? So we know that someone has MS, we know that it's early in their course, we know that we wanna pick and choose something that we think would be the best for them, but now we have so many decisions. There's so many things to think about. Whoever thought that we would have all of this and think about, but it's fantastic. So we have first, second, and third line therapies, okay? But we have increasing efficacy, perhaps, and increasing burden of disease and treatment. So we, we, in safety, so we have all these things that we have to think about now. These would be considered kind of the first generation, the injectable therapies, the oral therapies, and then as we go towards the middle, we're getting into things that are very anti-inflammatory, immunosuppressant, some, some of the things uh, impact trafficking, uh, so on and so forth, up to and including autologous stem cell transplants. So when we see patients with MS, we have to kind of think about where is this individual, you know, on that, timeline that we talked about and what is it that is going to be most important relative to where they are at that time point. So these are all of the things that we think about. Now what are the barriers to treatment? The barriers as I see them, I see that drug delivery can sometimes be a barrier. 
I have patients that just quite frankly can't take an injection. They're needle averse. Uh, and even though they tell me they're taking their medications, they really don't. Um, I know that. <laughs> so it's okay. I don't like needles either. Um, pills. Some people have really hyper gag reflexes and they just can't swallow pills. They can't tolerate a capsule. Um, they're not going to take something twice a day, for example. And then infusions. You know, even though infusions on that last slide show great efficacy, infusions sometimes can have problems associated with them. So, and some people are risk averse. I see patients, they're young, maybe they have a couple of toddlers and they kind of weigh the risk and the benefit of everything and they decide that maybe they don't want to do that. And I respect that because we have so many choices. The second potential barrier to treatment in, in, from where I'm sitting are side effects. All right, um, we call them AEs, adverse events. Um, not really serious adverse events. I don't see too many of those. But I think this is a barrier for individuals and I'll be curious to know what you think at the end of the discussion. And finally, to me, and I've highlighted this in caps, cost, cost, cost. I think that the cost of these drugs is causing problems right now for me as a provider when I try to pick and choose what I think might be the best for you. It's causing problems for you because your contracts are changing every year. These employer-based benefit contract programs, I'm not talking about Medicare per se, but some of the commercial things and how they're offered. And it is, it's just been very problematic lately to get patients on drugs and to keep them on drugs because for some reason, somebody up there in the sky seems to think that they know more about multiple sclerosis than those of us in the room do. You can't see all the print on this slide, but all I want you to know is the cost of a disease-modifying therapy from the beginning until right now, the cost, this is, this is, this is the, the escalation of costs with these products. It's expensive to research and develop these drugs. I, I understand that completely. But when we think about products that, you know, that are in the, the low 20s now being $80,000, you can see where the payers kind of get bent out of shape about some of this stuff, okay? So what I want you to understand, and I want you to understand this so that when your drug is denied, you don't feel like you need to call up the office and scream at my nurse. I want you to understand this, that we have nothing to do with this, okay? This is the distribution chain for drug delivery in the MS space, okay? And this is how it works. Basically, there's the drug maker, and thank goodness, we have all these fantastic scientists that engage in R&D. They do this wonderful work. Remember I showed you the big onion with the, with the target and all the dots on it? You know, because we're working towards trying to find a cure for MS. So that's fantastic. But what happens is you have all these other people in the middle of this. You've got the drug maker, the wholesaler, the pharmacy. That's y'all. Y'all are kind of over here on the side. Then you've got this thing called a pharmacy benefit manager, which is the guy in the middle, very powerful person, entity in the middle. And then you have your health insurance company. And remember, you're over here in the corner. So, and you probably don't understand how any of this works, because I certainly didn't until I had to like get on the phone and beg and plead to try to get medications for my patients. But the way it works is, if a drug is made, it may have a wholesale price, but that price is negotiated by the guy in the middle, and there may be benefits that pass back to the insurance companies by virtue of going with certain products. Not to say that any of that is a bad thing, it is just the system. And I think as a consumer, uh, someone who has MS, someone who needs to be on one of these very important disease modifying therapies to prevent relapses, to stabilize your MRI, to prevent disability so that you can say, I am proud to say that I have NIDA, I've established NIDA. It's important to know that behind all of that, that this system is in, at play. So if we send in PAs and they get denied, it's not because of anything that you did or I did or we did. It's just that the system is trying to work out what they think might be the best option for the patient based on the contract, okay? 
So MS therapies have these things, and I want you to be aware of what that's called. It's called a step edit. And you may have never heard of this before. You probably just heard that your doctor wrote this product and it got denied. Well, a step edit means that that's the way that the, um, that the uh, pharmacy P&T committee for that insurance company has put together their formulary. Based on the science and maybe based on the cost and maybe based on the rebates, they've come up with a system of how you will work through getting the medication that you need. And we, we know how this works. In Alabama, I've just kind of thrown up the latest step edits so you will understand that. So if we write for an injectable therapy or an oral therapy, there's no step edit. So there shouldn't be any, and Ocrevus, which is a newer um, FDA approved infusion that's twice a year, they have no step edit. So if we write these, we typically don't get too much pushback from the insurance payers. Now that's primarily Blue Cross Blue Shield because they're the number one payer in this area. Um, and then all this is a little bit different for, for Medicare. But Two-step edits, you would have to fail two drugs to get Tessabri, so you'd have to take an injectable, two injectables, one injectable, one oral, before you could be approved for Tessabri, all right? Three-step edit, which I don't understand necessarily for the first one, because it wasn't tested that way, but that's the way it's been positioned. You'd have to fail one, two, or three drugs before you could take this, and that's not the way it was tested, but. That's the reality of just the way it is. Like I say, it's a barrier. And then this one, I think the, the pharmaceutical company would agree and most of the MSologists would agree, we probably would impose, we, the community, the scientific community would probably say there should be a triple step edit on that drug, okay? So that's kind of how we have to think about it and how we have to approach this as we go through the process of ensuring that you get what you need, that we work together, to try to achieve NIDA for you. So what does the decision tree look like? And this is what it really looks like. You know, at the end of the day, we want to practice evidence-based medicine. We want to do the best for you that we can possibly do based on the science. We want to make sure that your safety is insured. You're not only our patients, but you become, you become part of our family. I mean, I'm treating MS patients now who are the children of the mothers that I've been treating for MS. I've been doing this a long time. And y'all know there's something very unique about this. We have just a real personal kind of a touch thing going on between us. This, this just isn't like a strep throat culture and an antibiotic. This is something much different than that. We're, we're, we're working together. Um, we want to make sure you tolerate your medication. We want to make sure it's convenient. We want to make certain that we have the ability to monitor so when we decide to escalate therapy, we want to make a contract together to ensure that you'll get back and forth so we can monitor labs and whatever. We want to always take into consideration pregnancy, not for everyone in the room. We got an older group in here tonight. But uh, remember, most of the folks that we see with first event are usually between the ages of 20 and 40, and most of these are women, so pregnancy. Cost we talk about, which in my estimation, it is a barrier. Um, patient preference, I listen to my patients. Y'all know I do. Sometimes I put my foot down, but I do listen. Uh, but I want to factor in patient preference and, and also caregiver preference. I think that needs to be considered when we, when we look at all of this. Physician experience. I don't think anyone in the room wants to be taken perhaps an infusion if their physician's never written that infusion before. I think that the infusions probably should be in the MS centers where the physician has a, a wealth of experience and the scientific underpinning to really understand how to best utilize that treatment. Response to therapy, mechanism of action, and so on and so forth. So this is why I have gray hair. This is what keeps me up at night. But this is why I love what I do. I, I really do. It's just so fantastic. So knowing that it's important for you, once you're diagnosed, to embrace MS therapy early, but also knowing how complex all of this is, and also knowing that we have barriers you ask yourself, what, what should I do? I mean, how, how, what can I do? How, how do I approach this? And this, this is what I think you should do. And it's very simple. 
and uh, this is not, you know, my way or the highway. This is just something that I came upon, and I, I think it kind of speaks to what I think you should do if you're a patient that has MS, and I, th I think it sums it up. I think that you have to remember that MS is going to be there for your whole life. It's not going to go away. We don't currently have a cure for MS, but remember I was there back in the day, and the disease-modifying therapies have made a huge impact on the quality of life and on the ability to perhaps to achieve NIDA. I think you need to take care of yourself, all right? Tracy's going to talk to you a little in more detail about that. And when I say take care of yourself, I'm talking to myself. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to rest, all right? We live in a very fast-paced world. I'm so glad that Stuart said, everybody, turn your phone off. Because you know what? At the end of the day, we come home from work, we all need to turn our phones off. It's consuming us. It's taking away from our ability to really engage in restful downtime, okay? Trust me. Eat well. I see we are tonight. Thank you, MS News and Views. That looks delicious. I can smell it from here. Exercise, exercise, exercise. I cannot begin to go into the scientific benefits of exercise, but it's very important. You think just because you have MS you shouldn't be moving, it's going to cause you to have fatigue and get worse and have a relapse, false. It's only going to improve your self-esteem, make you feel better, and make you sleep better at night. And that, at the end of the day, will help you to reduce stress. This is a secret to success. And also, find a strong support network, like to here, tonight. Um, like going online and looking at these YouTube videos. When you have this network, when you're connected to other people outside of your zip code, you will become empowered. And that really, at the end of the day, will help you on this journey as you continue to achieve the best outcome that you are looking for for yourself. And finally, develop a relationship with a healthcare provider whom you trust and respect. It's very important. You know, there's a lot of great healthcare providers in our community. I, take, I say all the time to individuals, there ain't nothing like Birmingham. There is not another place like this town and this state. We have incredible resources for folks that have MS. We have dedicated healthcare professionals. I'm not talking about physicians. I'm talking about PAs, nurse practitioners, occupational therapists, physical therapists, personal trainers. You name it, they're here in this town. So we're very blessed in that way. So that's it. I'm going to end up there, and then I'll take a few questions. Um, my friend? Thank you, Emily. You're welcome. Great talk, Dr. Reiser. Thank you. Everybody thank Dr. Reiser. Yeah. Very good. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go around the room, all right? We're going to take questions if you... We're going to hope that you have questions, right? And Ken is going to be on this side of the room. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Let him acknowledge that you want to ask a question. Same with me on this side of the room. Just acknowledge, let me acknowledge, raise your hand. Let me know. I know that you all have questions, so please raise your hand. Let us go around the room. Know that when we get to you, we're going to hold the mic and put it up to your mouth. I'm not going to knock out your teeth, but we got to hear what you're saying. So please let me do that. So who's got the first question? Diane, right? Who's got the first question over here? Diane will speak to exercise and fitness, though. Diane, tell everyone about the Lakeshore Foundation, just a blurb. <laughs> the Lakeshore Foundation. Oh, Lakeshore is the best thing you could do for yourself. It got me motivated to move, and I got out of my wheelchair. So exercise, exercise, exercise is a big deal. Yes. If you don't know about Lakeshore Foundation, uh, it's a nonprofit um, organization that was designed to help individuals who have physical disability. Um, the original founders of Lakeshore were all individuals that had something going on. And when you look at the facility, and it's, I mean, it's unbelievable. There's nothing like this in the world. It was designed by these individuals. Everything was designed to the T to make certain that it's totally accessible for individuals with all levels of disability. And then they have fantastic programs there for patients with MS, whether it be water therapy, resistance training, 
the cranking class, which I love. I always tell them, you look like a crank because they have actually this upper body crank class, all kinds of things, Pilates, yoga, Tai Chi. So if you haven't checked it out, I would recommend it. It's a fantastic resource. So I think that everybody here probably has a question, but they're afraid to ask. So I'm going to ask the first one, all right? And that is, um, so I've heard about, you know, like Lemtrada therapy and stem cell research and uh, what stem cell can do for a person. What is the difference with what you're doing to the person's immune system? Okay, so Lemtrada, and we had a picture there where we talked about it, where it's placed. Remember, it's in the bullseye for an FDA-approved therapy. Lemtrada is a monoclonal antibody. It targets something on the surface of lymphocytes, which are T cells and B cells, called CD52. And what this monoclonal antibody does by virtue of targeting this CD52 is it depletes the lymphocytes that are at play. Remember I told you they come from the periphery, they go into the central nervous system, and they promote you know, demyelination and axonal degeneration. So giving Lemtrada, this monoclonal antibody, which is an infusion, um, it will deplete all of those players, all of those active lymphocytes that are causing multiple sclerosis. The first cycle of this drug, the Slimtrata, is given over five days. It's an infusion. And then the patient would go for a whole year. These lymphocytes would reconstitute the B cells about six months, the T cells about a year. And then a second cycle would be given for three for three days. So the idea here is that maybe by virtue of doing that, that when you have this reconstitution, that it might change the immune landscape. And this Lemtrada was tested against a gold standard drug, which is a high dose, high frequency interferon, and it was shown to have superior efficacy to what we once considered to be gold standard, and it had a very profound impact on disability. And as I mentioned, disability is one of those huge things that I think MS patients worry about the most. So it's you know, people ask me, what, was that like a stem cell transplant? I guess you could say it's a pseudo stem cell transplant. But Stuart's asking me about um, uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplants and what that is. It's a little bit different than receiving an infusion, a monoclonal antibody. What it is, is basically, you know, taking out, you know, cells and, and, and basically suppressing your immune system and then kind of rebooting your immune system in a way with these very naive cells hoping that once you've taken away the bad immune landscape that these naive cells can then mature into lymphocytes that don't have perhaps the same recognition for those bad things that were once tickling them and triggering them to cause the cascade for multiple sclerosis. So one would be an infusion. Like I say, it's only given two times based on the clinical trials and the science of it. That's not to say it couldn't be given a third time, uh, but it's traditionally given twice. The other is a very in-depth process that's not yet commercially available. Uh, it's not FDA approved, so the payers in our area would not be on board for paying for something that that might cost $100,000 or more. But there are some great centers um, in the United States that do this kind of work. Uh, we recently had a patient return from Chicago uh, who had a um, hematopoietic um, stem cell transplant. He tolerated the procedure very well, and, he, and he's doing well. And I've had other patients that have, have gone to that, that particular um, facility. So I think it's there. It's out there. I think that people are pushing the envelope. Like I say, I mean, when you look at that one round circle with all those dots on it, can you believe it? So when I come back, you know, Stuart, what, two years from now? Um, that thing's going to be so, so ginormous, we won't even be able to put it on a screen. But uh, that's kind of what Lemtrada is, and that's what st stem cells are, and it's kind of interesting, right? Thank you for that answer. Absolutely. Um, I know that you were, you went through the different theories as to why am I going through this with the vitamin D and um, 
the Epstein-Barr virus and those things that may have contributed to what actually caused the disease. As you are diagnosed and you go through the drug therapies, are there additional testing that is done to test for those things that may be contributing factors that you can't control, like the vitamin D? Are, is there testing that goes with that that kind of changes the types of drugs that are included? Because I know that the types of drugs attach different parts of the things that are associated with those. So is there additional testing that goes with that? So it's a great question, I, and I, I know where you're going with it. So when we think about the possible etiologies, right, we don't know for sure, but certainly a vitamin D test is something that can be routinely done in the clinic. We tend to do it every four months. And what I'm finding, I, we probably should write it up. Tracy, it's a paper. We need to write it up. Everybody that I see with MS is vitamin D deficient. I mean, you would say, you, you would say well, 30 is normal. No, it's not. Not really. 30 is not normal. Even though it's in that little reference range, it should be 50, 60, 70, 80. Okay, so most of the patients I see are vitamin D deficient, so simple to treat, and most patients with MS need to be on maintenance vitamin D. That's what I'm finding in my practice, um, and I think that other MSologists are talking about that as well. So every four months you do that. Now, screening, you know, Epstein-Barr Epstein -Barr antibody titers, nobody's doing that. that. That doesn't give us any useful information. Um, you know, checking a diastolic blood pressure, we do it, but if it's 92, that doesn't tell us if somebody's going to have a relapse or not. Measuring BMI, it's important to try to know that someone is obese and to try to offer up an exercise program, but there's no science to say that, well, if we get the BMI to that, then MS will, you know, suddenly go under the radar screen. So we don't have that, but I think where you're going is do we have biomarkers? Do we have the ability to draw a tube of blood when you come in the clinic and say, guess what? Based on that X and Y slide I showed you with disease efficacy and safety and what have you, we picked this because your immune landscape has told us that we picked this, that it would be the most effective for you. And that's the way the oncologists do it. Not only with just biomarkers, but genetic markers and so on and so forth. That is where this is going. Now, in clinical trials, they do a lot of this stuff, okay? And there are a few phase four things that are coming out now, even with some of the drugs that we're using, where the pharmaceutical company is looking at post-marketing in patients that are taking these drugs, trying to understand now what does everything look like, okay? So the biomarker, I think, research is gonna be the key research to really telling us exactly whether somebody needs to be on one drug or a combination of drugs. Do we need to do induction therapy and then come behind that? What does this look like? And that's where it's going. And I'm excited um, because I'd love to come back to talk to you guys about that. Yep. The cold and the flu season is upon us. Yes. Um, there are flu shots, pneumonia shots, whatever. Now, if someone is immunosuppressed, can they or should they take any of those vaccinations? Okay, so the question always arises about vaccinations. And the consensus, I suppose, from the consortium is that all vaccines are fine if they're killed vaccines. You should avoid live vaccines. And um, those are going to be like flu mist. You know, the shingles vaccine was live, but now they have something new that's just come out that's, that's not live. So just as long as it's a kill vaccine, that's okay. There's also some implications for vaccination prior to starting an immunosuppressive therapy. So say your doctor thinks you need to be on an, immun an MS drug that has immunosuppressive qualities, they might wanna tee you up for vaccinations about six weeks before they start that. Does that make sense? Okay, because once you're immu really immunocompromised, then you might not have the ability to mount an immune response to a vaccine. So the vac so always talk to your healthcare providers about vaccines, okay? And remember, um, whooping cough is back. I don't know if y'all know that. So if your Tdep is not up to date, and I found this out through having grandchildren, you know, the pediatrician said we couldn't hold the grandchildren if our, if our Tdep wasn't up to date. So, and that's because of, you know, whooping cough, pertussis, so. So just the vaccine story is an important story. 
golly, remember on the wheel, there was the talk about vaccines. Think about if you had a vaccine, for example, to, uh, to, to, to really dampen down the JC virus. I mean, so there's people working on all kinds of interesting vaccines. But always have this conversation about vaccines with the healthcare provider. If you're traveling out of the country, if somebody that doesn't know anything about MS wants to give you something, check it out with somebody in the know uh, before you go taking all these things. All right? Question. Yes. What can you tell everybody here about how they can really know if they're having a relapse rather than something that's just maybe heat related? Yeah, that's a great question, Stu. Uh, so how do you know you're really having a relapse? So by definition, as we know, it's something that translates into a functional impairment. It lasts for more than 24, 48 hours for sure. It's not associated with fever. Um, and it's not really exacerbated or brought on by heat. So if you extract all of that, and also you're not just having a meltdown, you know what I mean? You've been at work all day, you had to pick the kids up from daycare, you come home, you don't have any groceries, everybody's screaming. I'm having a relapse. Well, maybe you're just stressed out. So, but the true MS relapse is going to translate into the, a functional impairment. And Tracy will talk more to this. This is something that impairs mobility, vision, ADL function, which is activities of daily living. So it's going to have a translational impact on those things. That would be a relapse. So for the people that think that they might be having a relapse because their walk has slowed, what do you have for them? Okay, so if you're, if you're just out walking, and it depends on whether it's hot or cold, it doesn't matter. Some MS patients actually get worse in cold. Um, so you're out and you kind of find that you're just kind of slowing down, you're not as fast as you used to be. That's probably not a relapse. That probably either is deconditioning, which I think Tracy will speak to. It's either deconditioning and or maybe your MS has moved. Maybe the disability score on the EDSS has moved to half a point. You didn't, you didn't realize it until someone asked you to walk 200 meters. So there may very well be that. It may be that you aren't quite Nita that you thought that you were. So there's two things, all right? So is there something that they could take to help them speed their walking ability? There is a medication that's FDA approved to improve the speed of walking based on the science where they tested it over the 25 foot time walk and it's called Ampira. Um, and it's a medication that you can take with an MS disease modifying therapy and it's uh, taken twice a day. And um, we use a lot of that in our clinic. Like I say, you know, we have PT in the clinic so they're really able to identify a lot of clients that would benefit from that. So the hard part though in Alabama, if you're not on a DMT, if you're not on a disease modifying therapy for MS and you have a commercial insurance, they will not approve that drug, which is bizarre. We go to bat for you, we fight for it, but uh, they really want to see that you have MS and that you're taking a disease modifying therapy. That seems to be kind of their protocol right now. Yep. I'm getting uh, emails and it, I'm on Copaxone and it's an email saying be careful and make sure that the doctor knows that you need to have the original instead of a generic, apparently, that's out there. Uh, I don't know which one I'm supposed to take, and I don't know which one the insurance company will pay for. Okay, uh, Janice, so it goes back to that, that slide I showed you about that very convoluted and very complex way in which disease-modifying therapies come from the the... The manufacturer, you know, from the to, through the wholesale through the distribution chain, um, and so basically we now have what we call biosimilars. So these are drugs that are manufactured to look like Copaxone. You know, they have the same things in them that are like Copaxone, okay? They call them biosimilars. Now, we can argue back and forth whether they're truly biosimilars or not. We don't have time for that. Um, but there was a small trial done by a doctor in the Cleveland Clinic where he tested a generic biosimilar drug to Copaxone, and he found that it was as effective as Copaxone. Well, you know, these trials are very short. MS is a, a, 
a condition that's, remember, for the life of that individual. So we have to take everything that we hear, see, read with a grain of salt. Now, Copaxone first came to market in a 20 milligram dose, right, that you injected every day. And then when that patent was to expire, they were urged by a gentleman who, had pa who has passed away, who is an incredible MSologist named Omar Khan. And Omar said, we really, we really need to increase the dose of Copaxone, but give it l fewer times, patients will tolerate that better, and it will be just as effective. And so they did the trial, and that was the case. But what's happened now that the 20 has gone to a generic, some other pharmaceutical companies can now, you know, come to market with a 40 milligram generic. Are you following me? And they can get into this chain here, and then they can have relationships with PBMs, with specialty pharmacies, with payers, with employers, to, to contract to price, okay? So what happened is they did that. But they didn't tell anybody else about that. They basically just stopped everybody's Copaxone, okay? This is the specialty pharmacy. They stopped everyone's Copaxone, didn't ship any Copaxone, forced us to do a, a PA on everybody. You can see how onerous this is. Everyone was really mad at me, and I really didn't know anything. I, I didn't know anything about this. I know a lot about it now. So apparently, if you're on branded Copaxone, that contract is good through the end of the year. So your specialty pharmacy, if you're on a commercial payer, they should honor that, and that's what we're seeing. So now everybody's back on Copaxone. Now, what would this look like in the new year? I think it'll just be kind of a battle between the, the generic folks and the branded folks. And they'll come up with something that we understand that's meaningful and we'll move forward. But that's the story, so hopefully you've gotten your drug. But it did take about four weeks. It was a rock solid four weeks where people really didn't get their drug, is what I'm thinking about that timeline. You could see where that upset the apple cart pretty, you know what I'm saying? I've had some other situations too, Janice, where a patient might be on a drug and a pharmaceutical, not, I mean a specialty pharmacy just substituted another drug. It was in class, but the drug was taken more often than the drug that they were on, so suddenly they were doing well on a drug that they only took three times a week, and the specialty pharmacy said that they had to be on a drug that they took every other day without asking the doctor or without asking the patient. So I think that this is an issue that's going to gain a little more traction, and I think we have to work together to, to make sure that patients get what they need. Yep. Brand versus generic and I've got Blue Cross Blue Advantage. Will there be a problem about generic, them wanting to keep the generic one and not pay for the brand one? It's and is the generic it's, just as good for real? We don't know. I mean, you know, you just don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to genomics, who is this person and what have you. We don't know. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, we also have to look at and, and resources. You know, copay assist and all these different things that are available for patients. Sometimes with the branded products, you have these higher number, higher dollar amount of support to help patients. And the generic companies don't have those resources to provide those kind of things. So, but all the contracts are different. So I'm totally open-minded to all of it. But my biggest beef is I don't want the patients to be blindsided by something without some dissemination of information, where at least we have some talking points so that we can give you a heads up. This is coming down, this is gonna happen, don't be afraid, it's gonna be okay. I think, it's, I think for you, it probably scares you when somebody sends you something that you, you, you're not used to taking. You haven't had a conversation with your doctor about that. So I think it creates anxiety. So I'm just hoping that as we go forward that we continue to communicate, we continue to work together. There's a lot of great choices. Um, and I, I'm happy about that. So, yep. Thank you for bringing that up, though. Another question. Yeah. A lot of people are asking about uh, if there is a washout period with Ocrevus as there was with, like, Tysabri. Okay, so Stu's asked the question, is there a washout period with Ocrevus as there is with Tysabri? 
So the groovy new lingo is sequencing, not like on the gown, the bling, not the sequins, but the sequencing. So the sequencing is the question that Stu's asking. How do we sequence between one drug to another drug to another drug? We have all these drug options now, right? So we have to think about the drug and the pharmacology of that drug, the mechanism of action of that drug, and when that drug is out of your system or the impact of what that drug no longer exists. So in the case of Tosabri, which is a monoclonal antibody that's infused, if you stop it, it kind of gets out within about 60 days. Now, in the case of an emergency, we can wash it out with something called plasma exchange. In the case of Ocrevus, which is a monoclonal antibody that's given every six months, you can't just sequence rapidly from that to something else because the impact of the Ocrevus is going to persist for six months. Now we have a biomarker that we can, we can actually draw the blood to know if there's been reconstitution after that Ocrevus, that last dose. But by and large, it's gonna be about six months. If we're lucky, four, but it's definitely gonna be about six months before we can transition to something else. Particularly if it's something that's gonna be uh, impacting lymphocytes, lowering lymphocytes. Any other questions? Any questions? Come on, everybody got it all going? If not, let's say thank you to Dr. Reiser. Thank y'all, appreciate it. Thank you.